What is going on? Entrepreneur Wrap episode 005. It's We're back. Your boy, David Brickley and Brett Regan. Mr. Regan, nice, nice mug. Hey, thanks, man. Big shout out to our new employee, Ben. Gave us a really awesome mug. He was in the Salty. Philippines and got us a, uh, a mug from Manila, the That's capital the wrong. city. Show it the other way to your camera. There we go. Oh, he, you got a different one. Oh, man. He's not giving everybody the oh, same one. Oh, I thought ones. we all got the same one. All right. He took the time and said, this, this represents Brett. I love it. All right. So as we do every single show, we run down what we learned this week, relevant businesses, what we're reading, tech tips, work-life balance, current business goals, all that and more, hopefully to help the entrepreneur out there or anybody else looking for just overall business talk. So let's uh, get into your relevant business news of the week, Brett. My relevant business news, I'm going to title this, Will Donald Trump Save Twitter? Mm. Uh, one of our other nice employees uh, mentioned that the other day and I looked into it. So um, obviously he's been super vocal on Twitter responding to SNL sketches <laughs> that are parodying him. Um, but then more recently he mentioned something about Boeing. Uh, And this was the actual script that he said, Boeing is building a brand new 747 Air Force One for future presidents, but costs are out of control. More than four billion. Cancel order! Exclamation point. And I feel like I read a little bit on this, but it sounds like he kind of has a point here. Potentially. I mean, it could be that it's too expensive. Um, But more than that, I think this is an example of signaling. This is the, you know, the highest office in the world. And the person who is the president elect now is saying something that affected Boeing in the stock market. Yep. So, um, you know, is this something that he's going to tone down over the course of his presidency? I would say probably not. Um, he hasn't yet. He hasn't changed his attitude at well, all. And here's a quote from him earlier today. I think I am very restrained on Twitter and I talk about important things. So this is his this is him being restrained talking about Alec Baldwin on SNL. Yeah. So in a in a couple different facets of business world, A, you know, um, in terms of Twitter being the go to press release for the highest office in the entire world, that's what it is right now. And business. something tells me yeah. that that's not going to change. So now if you really want to hear what the president of the United States is going to say, your best bet yeah. is to go to Twitter. Right. Is that going to give them more users and have people think of it in a different light? Potentially. Um, I know probably because of that now I'm on Twitter a little bit more just to see like, holy shit, what is he going to say? Is it going to be crazy? Is it going to be important? Um, and the Boeing uh, comment wasn't really totally out of control. It may have a point. But to your point, I mean, obviously every single news outlet covers the leader of the free world, as you put it. So do you really need to be on Twitter to get that tweet within seconds? Or is MSNBC and any other outlet just going to say, here's what Trump tweeted last week or right. today or whatever? And they will do that also. Which is However, free PR, right? Um, Trump's argument to why he wouldn't go through traditional outlets is because he has said for a long time that the you know the liberal media and the you know professional media has never covered him properly so he's skipping them yeah. and twitter allows to skip them but this is another quote uh, or a tweet from him that we can pull up i believe as well said if the press would cover me accurately and honorably i would have far less reason to tweet sadly i don't know if that will ever happen so i do think this is partially him Mike, not can we talking, get the rundown graphic up to the side of Brett? Thanks. Uh, I think this is partially him just saying, I'm going to bypass all of that. I don't know if you saw in the last one, but I think it was something like, you know, 45,000 retweets, 129,000 yeah. likes on the Boeing tweet. Um, so this is something where he's putting the message out there and then media outlets are asking him about his tweet. So they're covering the... It's you almost know, as if Twitter has found a way to have the biggest influencer in the world use their platform almost exclusively it's the most powerful office in the entire world and the guy who's elected yeah. that's his primary go-to when he wants to talk about something so um a little more on the actual boeing part uh when interviewed i believe by the new york times in his building afterwards he said it's going to be over four billion dollars for the air force one program and i think it's ridiculous i think boeing is doing a little bit of a number We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. So, you know, what this shows me is that potentially down the road, he's going to make a press release via Twitter, and then the press is going to come to him Mm -hmm. to start covering that. So they're going to be covering a story that he's already broken, essentially. Um, So I think for, you know, in overall for business for Twitter, I see it as a positive sign. Maybe the, you know, Twitter higher up people aren't super excited that it is Trump 
that is the one who could be saving the because they've platform been, essentially now. Yeah, yeah, and they've generally been pretty liberal leaning and trying to stop alt right accounts and fake news. But um, you know, I he has a little bit of a point in that you know there were so many news outlets that were so wrong about the election, yeah. and so wrong about polling. That, you know, there's a little bit more clout to his statements now that, hey, I'm going to go direct to the public. But he has to be very careful about what he says because there are real life business repercussions when you do and something like that. You lo- looking at the history of media, no longer do you have to beg Barbara Walters to sit down across from you on a couch and have a 60 minutes type interview to get something off your chest or to explain something to the country. And although a lot of people disagree with the way he does it, I do feel that. He is using the new medium in which, hey, I have something to say. Right. And this is how I'm going to do it. Well, and to and kind not of, rely on a third party to hopefully turn the narrative in a direction that you want it to go. Right. And and one of the things we've discussed quite a bit on previous episodes is that Twitter is really a fire hose. There's no yeah. logarithm because of that. Though each independent, you know, tweet that you're putting out doesn't feel like this really hard statement, mm-hmm. especially if like you're if super a, active all the time. If he did a um, op-ed on medium.com every time he had something to say, it'd be a little bit different. Even to have, me, it would yeah. feel different as a Facebook post. Right. You know, yeah. it would feel like that's a little more official. It feels like somehow this is like coming from the Trump camp. True. Twitter feels like this is him just rattling off exactly what he's thinking. And so because of that, it kind of puts it in a better light, in my opinion, for situations like this. Yeah. Uh, All right, so for my relevant business news of the week, I'm going to Instagram, so another social media platform. And we've talked a lot about this with Instagram stories, and I've given, I've really applauded them for their explore tab and and the algorithm that they've done for video. But read an article uh, actually today on Mashable that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, Instagram is going to Facebook, essentially. I mean, it's becoming another Facebook. It used to be all about photos. It used to be a really standalone platform but look at this just in the last um six months back in june they introduced the algorithm which seems like that was years ago but it was only in june in august they start instagram stories so competing directly with snapchat in november they uh introduce live video so essentially you can go live but the broadcast disappears right when the the broadcast is over and now they're uh, enabling people to like other people's comments the same way you can like and reply on comments on Facebook. So Facebook obviously owns Instagram. Facebook now turning Instagram a lot more Facebook than what it originally was. I also think they're turning it a lot Snapchat. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah, I mean, they've Facebook has done a really tremendous job of making Instagram more, um, I guess, just valuable to the end user. I, you know, if you had told me six months ago that Instagram was going to copy a lot of Snapchats, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess not proprietary, but their kind of signature style, I would have felt like it would have been a failure. It would have looked like they were just being a copycat, but it seems to have worked. A hundred million people use Instagram stories daily now. That's a pretty incredible number for just a new part of your platform. But yeah, I mean, the, if you go back six months and look at Instagram as a platform and look at it now, it's almost like a brand new app. And we always talk about on this podcast about evolution and changing with the trends and making sure you react to the market. Nobody's done that better probably than Instagram right. in the last And six then months. VaynerMedia is his, is, you pronounce the last name Vaynerchuk? Vaynerchuk. Yeah. Vaynerchuk. He was on Cheddar yesterday or the day before and they were asking him about Snapchat um and he essentially was saying, "Hey, look, you know, 5 months ago, 4 months ago, I would have been incredibly bullish on Snapchat." However, now. I underestimated how successful Instagram was going to be in doing some of their copy. Especially if you already have a built in following, then that just goes to your whole audience at the top of the field. Right. And what, what he was saying is like, you know, it didn't steal a bunch of the people from Snapchat to go to Instagram. What it did is stop the flood of late 30s, 40s, yeah. 50s from feeling like in order for me to do this type of content, I need to be on Snapchat. Mm-hmm. They're able to do that with a feed that they're already using. So that flow from Instagram and Facebook over to Snapchat for the older generations has probably slowed a little bit. I don't and, have numbers to support that. Well, but. And I think um, with the loss of Vine and, you know, musically continue to gain stream, uh, you know, I, I steam, excuse me, um, there's kind of a little a little opportunity there, I feel like, for a new app to come through because now that Instagram's become more like Facebook, there may be an app that's more Instagram, what it originally was, which is more photo-based or musically maybe becoming <laughs> that looping Vine type of platform that people are going to. So I feel like there's a little little bit of a niche being carved for the next new app to come because some of these apps are, are throwing away some of the original features that made them so good. Right. Well, and in in our business, we use tons of different business apps. 
and there's um, so many of them that are really great at doing one particular thing. But in the end, you really wind up only using two or three of them because there's just not that much room in your life to be able to use all those. Yeah. And do you feel that way about social? I mean, if they're, do you really feel like you're going to be able to have consistently post to five different platforms, five or even care enough to go and click to another one? Because Mm -hmm. for me, just Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter Maybe once every couple of weeks, I'll go to Snapchat and look through something, but it's not because it's not valuable. It's just because for me, I don't have that much time to really invest in looking at all those different, you know, feeds. So I, I almost feel like there may be a little bit of a maximum number of feeds that can be relevant to any one person, and everyone's going to be fighting for that two to three, like, central feeds. Yeah, I mean, I find myself almost to a fault cycling through the four apps, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Okay. And even going in one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, like if you're really bored or what have you. But, uh, but yeah, I think to your point, I think because I used to have Vine in that social media folder on my iPhone, Musical.ly's in there, Pinterest is in there, but... You can only do about four, honestly. Right, and for me, it's probably post all of them. For me, it's probably three, and Facebook owns two of them. So you know, sixty-six percent of my time spent on social, which is substantial, is all going through one company. So they're still killing. Becomes the platform you spend the most time on, but post the least on. I think Snapchat would probably be for me. I post the most on, Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's how it goes. All right. So what we learned this week as entrepreneurs, uh, I will go first on this one. I told you this uh, at our lunch yesterday, but I had this epiphany. Like I said, it might be a silly analogy, but I was just thinking about this on the road coming into work on Monday. And, you know, with newer clients and sometimes um, different things coming up that you can't expect, it sucks. And I think, you know, sometimes I think you have to look at it like it just sucks because, you know, sometimes you look at it like, oh, it'd be nice to just be on the couch or it'd be nice not to deal with this client fired. It'd be nice not to have to deal with this employee's issue. But really, what's the alternative? I think, you know, I looked at it like Beyonce. She makes $50 million a year, but she has to wake up at 5 a.m. and work out. She has to do dance choreography. She has to be on the tour bus. She has to be in hotels, do press tours. All that stuff isn't work. amazingly fun. Yeah, it's work. So whether you make you know ten grand a year, $50 million a year to the President of the United States or whatever your job may be, there's going to be parts and lulls where you're like, Ugh, there's so many other things I'd rather be doing right now. Right. And I think some people compare that moment like, Ugh, I wish I'd be doing something different, as if there's this fain out there that you'll be doing exactly what you want to do 100% of the time, exactly how you want to do it. And I just don't think there's any, from entertainment to LeBron James to whoever, uh, there's always going to be a part of it, running sprints or whatever, that you're like, I really don't want to be doing this right now, but I have to. I totally agree. That I mean, It goes back a little bit. I think my quote last week was something about like adventure and you know that whole venture portion of it, where in anything that you do that's enjoyable, we got a note oh, here no, for Mike. Sorry getting uh, letters here. So, you know, in, in anything that you do that's going to have a payoff, uh, there's going to be parts of it that suck. If you can go back to your fondest memories yeah, as a I child know. of, you know, winning a big game, but you don't think about all the shitty practices you had to go through and all those things. So and I think that there's going to be negative parts that of That happens in sports a lot with uh, Bo Jackson or Michael Jordan. They're, they put on this pedestal now where – they made every shot and they made every game winner. Like if you actually go back and watch Michael Jordan's 82 game season back in 96, he had a few clunkers. He missed a right. lot of game winners. He got crossed over and you know got blown past on defense. So um, yeah, I think there's this, I don't know, this unattainable thing out there that people think they can reach. But then a day, no matter what industry and what you're doing, there are going to, the goal is obviously 85% of the time, you're actually having fun, you're feeling good, you're doing what you love, but there's always going to be that small percentage that you're like, well, I got to dig in and do this, even though it's not right. my most favorite thing to do. Yeah, and every, I mean, Kobe Bryant, I think, is a great example of someone who very clearly loved the game of basketball. He was dedicated to it, and everybody always talks about it. he was the first one in the gym, right. he was the last one out of the gym, right. he was out shooting three-pointers for whatever. Something tells me that during those, he was like, I'm not enjoying this. Oh, but yeah, I, exactly. I have to do this. You and so I those, have talked about that. Those parts of that, of just getting to the point where you're like, you know, doing something that you have to yeah. do so that you can get to the point I you I think the specific to. exercise you and I have talked about a lot just when you when you work out and is deadlifts. At no point are you ever like, I really love this right now. You know this what? is I, really I, I actually yeah, like that. You're deadlifts. crazy, that's why. Um, all right. So what uh what did you learn this week? Uh so a little bit in a similar vein. Um I said Sometimes you've got to roll up your sleeves and do it yourself, dot, 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 for now. Um, but that's not necessarily sustainable over the long term. So um, I 
maybe last week we talked about the challenge of I, learning I learning how to say no. Week. Yeah, exactly. Learning how to say no to clients potentially, but you know there was an opportunity for a really awesome client that we're glad that we're working with right now. Um, but in terms of having a ton of staff to be able to handle it, it was a brand new project. Uh, something where I needed to just roll my sleeves up and do it. And moving forward, um, I think that we can look at this as a new opportunity, a new space to get into and do a lot more of it and have people to do it. Um, so this was an occasion where we had to roll our sleeves up. You're doing the same thing with another of our clients now really digging in and doing right. a lot of the work and not subbing it all out to employees because it has to have a heavy hand, um, of us. So, you know, that's, that's what I've learned is, you know, at a certain point, if you really want to say yes to a project and you know, it's great for the future of the company, you may just have to have some late nights and yeah. it's not going to be super fun. But on the other side of it, uh, I feel like we're going to be really glad that we did it. And then we'll also be able to, you know use some of that experience and use some of those case studies to be able to get new people and hire great people to do it in the right. future. I think we uh, might to, need to skip this next to the, topic. We'll, we'll at least bring it up <laughs> because I, I, it is worth mentioning. Yeah. So the what, what we're reading, the what we're reading, I'll be totally honest. Yeah. I uh, went to an appointment on Sunday. I read about, I'll say eight sentences out of a New Yorker article and put it down and started playing poker on my phone because I just <laughs> couldn't do it. Um, so I haven't really been doing as much reading as I'd like. Um, yeah, no, really, I'm still really on at the all. Jim Collins, good, the great book, still, still right there on chapter three. Uh, just having, a, you know, I mean, I guess there's always time, I guess, and I'll get into this a little bit later. But I think sometimes the it's probably better to read a chapter than play the poker. So it's it's kind of like that struggle because I do that a lot where I'm just like getting lost in my phone, getting lost right. in the Instagram explore. But I mean, tab. yeah, that's, you know, unfortunately I feel like sometimes that's my meditation other than, you know, I should sit down and close my eyes and actually meditate or yeah. take a nap or do something. But when I'm completely zoned out and my brain just is not functioning anymore, sometimes I'll go to scrolling through the same social feed and looking <laughs> at the same photos, or I'll just play poker on my phone. Cause it's a little bit of mental stimulation, but it's fun. Right. Um, so that's all to say that I haven't read anything. All right, so moving on to our tech tip. Uh, so for me, I just, I don't know why I just realized this, but I can never get my iOS calendar on my iPhone to properly sync with Google calendars. I thought it was synced, but it wouldn't notify me. It wasn't really a clean interface. At the end of the day, I really don't love the calendar feature that the iPhone gives you. So went to the App Store, and obviously Google Calendar has their own specific app. It's not like the Google Drive app. It's more the calendar app. Um, it alerts you 10 minutes before every, every meeting. Um, it has a very clean interface, and I mean, downloaded last week, and I'm, it's changed me a lot because, I, like I said, I just didn't trust iOS app, and it was uh, not user friendly. So, really recommend the Google Calendar app. Yeah, and you know, in our line of business too, like we just don't want to be late to any yeah, calls. Exactly. We don't want to be late to any meetings. And sometimes when you've got a bunch of internal meetings <laughs> that you kind of realize, like, hey, if you're two minutes late, or somebody's like, hey, we got this meeting right now, versus a client call that you absolutely need to be prepared for and on time for, it's important to have those notifications. So that's a good tip. But I have at not that point, too, I think we both need to do a better job of client meeting isn't any more important than uh, internal meeting or employee meeting. Right. I think sometimes things get pushed all the time. But if we put it on the calendar, that we need to meet at 11, and it's always 1117. That's bad too. Because right. people have everybody in our office has different things they're doing They're saying, Okay, I'm gonna finish this, I got the, I got the meeting at 11, then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna tell the client that I can get back to my 1130. Because by that time, the meeting will be over. Well, if you keep on if you're late to that stuff. So I think the goal even with the new app for me is like, let's, you know, let's start meetings on time, what, yep. regardless of what they are. And with that, I think maybe we can, uh, only have meetings when absolutely necessary. And, oh, and ten, sometimes 10, 10, 10, 15 minutes is plenty of time. Um, Google automatically gives you like 30 minutes. So I tend to set 30 minute meetings where sometimes 15 will do. Um, but we did that recently. We interviewed a bunch of candidates on the phone. I just set boom, 15, boom, boom, minute 15 minutes. And yeah. I think we were off the phone like an 11 and a half usually. Call the next person. Like that was really, I mean, in an hour, we interviewed four really good candidates. And I think we got a lot accomplished instead of, you know, making it a whole half day. So. Yep. Uh, so my tech tip is called Gboard. It's Google's keyboard uh, that you can use with iOS. iOS oh, yeah, has, so I need to download this. Okay. iOS has something somewhat similar, according to other employees in the office, but I really do like Gboard. Mike, can you play uh, the video? No audio. Yeah, Facebook Live here. Um, so this will show you a little bit of it, but essentially the explainer video goes... Uh, through exactly what I go through on a pretty regular basis where I'm texting with someone, um, I need to find something or find an address, I leave text, 
go to Safari, look something up, find an address, copy, and go back, and Safari, paste. Every, I mean, then you copy. This happens like 50% of the time. You go to Safari, you copy the link, and then you go to your text to, to paste it, and it's not the right the right thing you just copied. Right. And that well, happens like 50% of the time. So Safari has like a bug or something, which is annoying. Yeah. But, um, you know, you can search locations. This, you can yeah. search videos. You can search GIFs if you just want to find this podcast brought to you by a Google. Fun, a fun GIF, but it's uh, it's smart. They knew that people were leaving text to go out to Safari or other things. And if you leave text to go do something and you're on an iPhone, I just saw it do something crazy with the restaurant. Yeah, um, but you're but you're very likely to go to Safari if you're on an iPhone rather than Google. So I think this is also a way for them to get more ser- search functionality. Well, and I've used their Google text. Chrome app, and it's actually a very clean interface, better than Safari. But for whatever reason, I think since it's the default on iPhone, people just tend to use it more. Right. But yeah, but that's, that's worth checking out. Go, it's free in the uh, App Store. All right. Uh, current business goals, David, take it away. Uh, so current business goals for me, I've been really big on trying to read up and watch stuff in our media spotlight. We'll show you this, but on leadership, I think it's very, very, very easy in the heat of battle, uh, in a week to not have a personal conversation with one of your employees. And that's, that makes my skin crawl. It's very unacceptable to me to, to not, um, do that. And I think, you know, you get busy, you're working on a certain team or a certain project and another employee may be working on a separate project and you don't have a lot of one-on-one time. And not to say that you have to take everybody out to lunch every week or you have to sit down with everybody for 15 minutes and say, how are you? But I think um, just a conscious effort to um, continue relationships, I think it's super important. And also the tools and training for some of our, you know, front office staff, if you will, or your managers uh, to have those same tools and training with their uh, uh, people underneath them. Because I think, you know, all of a sudden you go a full week, two weeks, three weeks, and you haven't had a meaningful conversation with one of your subordinates, if you will, uh, it's unacceptable. So I think it has to be a conscious effort that you constantly have to make one of your priorities each and every week. Yeah. Um, and, you know, normally I'm not handling a bunch of the actual accounts once they're already closed. Mm-hmm. But over the last couple of weeks, um, I've been, you know, working on a red carpet event that we did and then another television show, a couple television shows. And it's uh, it was kind of fun just being able to be with a crew of people yep. and, um, you know, helping everybody out and kind of managing projects. Um, but when, you know, when you do that, it's kind of fun to just have like a super positive attitude, especially when everybody's tired and everybody's a little stressed out and there's a lot well, going on. And you and I both worked at a restaurant when you were in college and, um, there was one manager in particular that would walk by you and you know who I'm talking about, but would walk by you every, and I, one day I, ca- one time I counted cause it bugged me so much. He must've walked by me 24 shifts in a row and never said a word. And, you know, there's 80 employees or whatever, and he's busy, and I get it. Never said a word. There's another manager that said, like, hey, so how's your fantasy team doing, Brickley? Pretty good? Yeah, you know, I think my quarterback, like, yeah, I'm starting this guy. And just that little yeah. thing, like, that was like, I love that dude. That's my boy right there. And the other guy, like, oh, yeah, screw that dude. Right. And the other guy probably wasn't meaningfully, consciously saying, I'm not going to talk to you today. But he just didn't make it a conscious effort. And I think sometimes you almost have to put it on your to-do list to do that sometimes. And it's almost as if sometimes when you're in a bad mood, just start smiling and all of a sudden you get in a better mood, right? Yeah, and unless it's something like truly horrific, you can kind of flip a switch and just be like, I'm just going to make a decision to have a positive attitude. So yeah. when a lot of these things are stressful or there's just a million moving parts and it'd be very easy to feel a little overwhelmed, um, yeah, sometimes I think it's kind of fun to just be overly optimistic and mm-hmm. positive and have a good time with the projects. And, um, you know, there's a few employees here that are super positive, optimistic all the time. We, you know, commend them for that, but it's contagious, so I like yep. that. Um, so for my current business goals... Um, you know, in the position that I'm in, I'm constantly looking for new clients, new opportunities, new stuff to do. Um, but one of the current business goals, I think for me and for the company, and we've talked a lot about this is just to make our current clients ecstatic with the work that we're doing. Um, so it's really easy to look ahead. It's really easy to look past current projects, you know, which you, you know, have to do in a certain sense to stay alive as a company. Um, but, you know, there was a situation yesterday where there was a little bit of back and forth with a particular client. And by the end of the day, the last email that they sent was like super positive. They were super pumped. And it was just like a little tiny extra mm-hmm. that we did to go from like where we could have been a little bit of butting from heads. From B plus to A plus. To yeah, deal. exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've got some really big projects coming up and I'm just looking forward to really dedicating a lot of brain power and money from these projects to be able to say like, Hey, you know, we've got a budget to be able to put towards this. We really want to 
give some of the money that we're earning for a project back to the client in the fact that we're going to be doing it amazing. Well, you and I always talk overboard. about this. It's like the domino effect, right? Like if you take on a new client, does that take away from the other clients? But like there's no, there's never a right answer. And you and I battle with that. That's probably it's the tough. toughest part of being a business owner. And you and I have just like racked our brain about this over the years. Like, okay, how much is too much? Like when does that, when does it tip? Because at a certain point you could, you could really be effective and be operating a hundred percent and all your clients are happy, but there's that one little change. Then right. all your clients go down to, like I said, B plus, and then another change that go down to C plus. Now you're in trouble. Right. Uh, but you also just can't have one client that you do everything for all day, every day you go out of business. So right. there's that balancing act that I think it just takes a lot of conversation and a lot of uh, whiteboarding out and you and I being like, Will this new client hurt us, help us? Can we take it on? Do we need to hire new people? Can we hire them in time for them to be ready to help? You know, those are all the things that we hear all the time. We've talked to people that they've scaled too quickly yep. and it all goes away. So it's uh, there's never a right answer, which is tough for yeah. a type A personality. And I, I do think that it is super valuable that there are two partners in this business. Mm -hmm. That way we can, you know, run things off. But, you know, me being in charge of new relationships and business development especially starting from nothing oh, no. where every every yes was like, you know, absolutely had to, you know, bring it on. There was no such thing as being picky. No. Sometimes I feel like one of those old grandmothers who went through like the depression and is like, you know, anytime there's food available, I feel like yeah. I just have to eat to, a, to a fault where like, it's unhealthy. You, you and I are talking about it, a new client. You're like, we cannot just say no. I remember you said that. And it's like, I think we have to. Right. And, and we did. I mean, it was, no, it was tough. tough and, and by the way, their response was totally, you know, like, hey, we totally get it. I know that it's tough this time of year kind of thing. But so you always heard those like uh, advice out there from Mark Cuban, the guys that are pretty high up there. Like um, you have to learn how to say no and say no more than you say yes. And like when you're first starting to come, you're like, yeah, sounds great in theory, but not going to happen. But we're starting to get there to a little bit of a right. point. And I think maybe in five more years, it's going to be maybe easier, but it's going to we're going to probably say no more times than not right because now we're just starting to say no yeah i mean yeah my my whole thing is like i don't want to say no twice in a row because then they just somebody, don't think of you anymore a yeah. big network who you really want to work with just because well, you don't have time like because this. pretty soon if you call somebody two or three times and they say no you're like, eh. if i say hey brett you want to go out this friday like nah man i'm gonna cool next friday hey brett you want to go out this friday nah oh. man I go, you know what i don't think brett's yeah, probably gonna so say that nah, man, and, and and that's the thing so we I said know. no to a sports network we said no to a television network yeah. on a couple projects where normally we would have made you know we would have moved the earth to figure out a way to say yes to those projects and we said no because it just it really wasn't feasible and at a certain point it's really not fair to the employees well, it, to say yes and then everybody's under the gun and um, i don't know like how long it takes to make a beautifully you know stitched louis vuitton bag but let's say it takes i don't know 50 hours or something if a client says, hey, you only have 13 hours, can you make it that same bag? You can't. I mean, if you want to keep the quality up and guarantee your product, yeah. at a certain point, you say, no, I need right. 50 hours. Yep. So, and, you know, the domino effect, as we talk about. Uh, Work-life balance. I'll kick it off there. All right. Um, so, yesterday, I've been, everybody in our office has come down with the plague over the last three weeks, I guess. There's certain, Open office. Yeah, there's certain people issues. that are cycling through uh, a second round of sickness and, you know, we even made a new policy that said, hey, if you're feeling a little sick, like take the day and get out and don't be here hacking and coughing like you can work from home. Um, but everybody's got sick. I think I was one of the last ones. Uh, but it's different. Mike, it's a different produce, producer Mike over here, I think, has got on Mike, his second round, perhaps. Yeah, Mike said it, it's, it's a new one. Um, so anyway, <laughs> yesterday... I, Essentially, it went through 13 people, mutated itself, and then came back around. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I Monday, I started feeling... I, I knew I was sick, and I stayed all day just because I had a project that I couldn't really leave, but I was here for, you know, 12-plus hours. And Tuesday, there was an opportunity to go home, and it made me feel like, you know, even just getting home at, like, I don't know, 2 or probably... Mm -hmm. um, it was nice. I got home at 2, and the even though I, even though I was sick, I was able to just be at the house and, you know have some soup and lay around and, you know, spend some time with the dog and the wife. Um, so from a work life balance perspective, I do think that every now and then I'll oh, try and find more opportunities where it's like, Hey, I can either knock some of the stuff out from home or this is a good day to just full on take a half day. And even if all that I do is go to the grocery store and like take a walk, sometimes those are big because on normal days, if we're leaving at, you know, six or six thirty or seven at night, you're sitting in traffic on the way home. By the time you get home, it's like, you know, eat dinner and watch a show and then it's kind of ready for bed. Right. So 
from a work-life balance perspective, I, I'm going to look for a few opportunities to maybe just buy a couple hours here and there because a the whole day is not feasible. I'm going to hold you. I'm going to I'm going to go back a couple podcasts and hold your feet to the fire here. So, how is the sleeping goal going at the going to bed at the same time each night? Um, it's not great, <laughs> but I haven't been. But you I, do the wind down still, just at different times, right? Right? Like, well, no, playing poker. N- what I haven't done is stayed up late when I didn't have to. Okay. And that was a that was an issue that I was having where I would just lay in bed and, you know, read or do something and I would know in my mind, like, just put it down. And then I would stay up for another hour and a half watching something that wow. wasn't even valuable. I wasn't learning anything. There was no like there was no value to it. So I've stayed up a lot later in certain circumstances, but only for work. And then partially out of just being tired on the other days where I don't have something, I'll be like in bed at 10, 10 30, which is pretty good. good. So it's a uh, work in progress as are most of my goals. Well, uh, to that point, my work life balance is, um, you know, my name is David Brickley and I'm an addict. Uh, when it comes to cell phone use, I mean, it's just like all day, every day on the couch at home in my bed. The first step is admitting. Yeah. You have I'm, a problem. I'm admitting. So, um, I just, you know, even I'm going to take uh, Lambeth out to lunch here today. I'm going to leave my cell phone at work. For thirty for thirty minutes or an hour, the the, the world's not going to come in. I know the emergency could happen, like hey, Brickley, but it's like it's going to be okay. Yeah. For forty five minutes, I don't need to be looking at my because you do. So as an addict, you almost have to like if it's with you, you're going to be the addictive yeah. personality. If you leave it in your car or leave it at home, um, so I, I'm you know we we run a digital marketing company. I think me being on my cell phone helps in a way, so it's a little bit different. I think, but um. It doesn't need to be 16 hours a day. It needs to be put away. So I'm at the gym. I'm on Spotify. On my couch, I'm on Instagram Explorer. In my bed, I'm listening to a YouTube video as I fall asleep. Like, it's constant. Yeah. So it can't be healthy. Um, so I need to uh, – the only way to do it is, like, put it in a drawer or charge your phone in the living room type deal. Um, so – I'm an addict. Yeah, I've uh, <laughs> I've noticed that too. Sometimes I'll like when I'm driving, there won't be a ping, there won't be an alert or anything, but I just feel this need to check my I phone know. while I'm driving, which is dangerous and dumb. Um, but I just feel like every you know couple minutes, I just feel like oh, I need to check my phone, which is you know well, clearly I, and pro- I, programmed. At I this watched point. something recently where I think it's dopamine is the is the anyways uh, with alcohol. Um, with you know drugs and even with cell phones, dopamine is released when you get a text from a friend. You're bored, so you text ten people, and then you get a ding, and then you feel better. Like that's an actual chemical reaction that's happening. So right. there's no doubt that our generation is addicted to that yeah. dopamine. There's been release. a lot of studies about that too, from like middle schoolers who post on you know Facebook or Instagram, and where like del- every every single but comment- they'll delete the Instagram if they don't have enough likes within a period of time. Like that's right. yeah, I know. Got to keep it's got to keep the winners, man. Scary stuff. Okay, all um, right. So media spotlight. You want to media spotlight? I don't have one. Mine didn't work. Okay, so, so let's go to yours. I will go to mine, Mike. If you want to pull this up, I this entire entrepreneur rap has really been a lot of stuff that I've learned and watched recently from Simon Sinek. He's uh, all about leadership and culture. And a really smart guy. Um, I'm glad I came across him. I actually tweeted out this entire video on my Twitter at David J. Brickley. So if you want to check out the entire thing, but wanted to show this quick clip to Brett and the viewers and listeners so we can uh, discuss. I love my job means I don't want to work anywhere else. I don't care how much somebody else will, is willing to pay me. I'm devoted to the people here and I care desperately about the people here as if they were my family. In business, we have colleagues and coworkers. In the military, they have brothers and sisters. That's how they think of each other, right? Mm. If you really have a strong corporate culture, the people will think of each other like brothers and sisters. It's like a family, right? No, brothers and sisters. Deep love, fight, but the love doesn't go away, right? Bicker, the love doesn't go away. And I'll fight with my sister, but if you threaten my sister, you're gonna have to deal with me. Right. Right? We'll fight internally. We'll bicker with each other. But nobody's going to hurt each other. And if anything from the outside shows up, you gotta, you're looking at a unified front. Brothers and sisters. Now, how do you create brothers and sisters out of strangers? Common beliefs, common values. You know, parents, in other words, executives who care about their children's success, who care to raise their children, teach them skills, discipline them when necessary, help them build their self-confidence so that they can go on and achieve something more than you could have ever imagined achieving for yourself. That's leadership. 
an absolute love and devotion for the people who've committed their lives. Is that, not, is that where it stopped? I don't think so. All right, that's where it stops. Okay. Um, we get the picture. But yeah, I think he, he got a little deep deep on that. But I think um, it, it, you know, the, the whole video is really good. I, I suggest everybody watches it out there. But uh, he made a good point in this whole talk too. Like, the, you know, when you do, when you're really good at a job, you get promoted at that job. So of course you micromanage the person that's now doing your job because you're better at them than that. So they're doing what you used to do. You're better than them. And so of course you're going to micromanage. So it's, it takes a very I think conscious effort to to lead, and I think as an executive or owner of a company, it really is similar to that parent mantra where you know you have to not raise children per se, but I think your employees it's super super important to have that. So I think um, there's there's a lot of stuff out there that I think can help us and make sure that we're being the proper leaders in a, in our culture and environment. Totally agree. That's all you got, huh? So I got. I <clears throat> I don't know uh, if his line of thinking pairs exactly. Well, with you mine. you say a lot with team and with the team. Team, I think the team Cleveland Cavaliers. Totally. I think you know Kyrie Irving would go to battle for LeBron James. Like that's their squad. That's what's going on. And I think um, you know family. I think that might you know make your skin crawl a little bit. Him yeah. using those terms, but I think from a team standpoint. You have to have each other's back, and I think if you just like, well, they're not figuring out, so screw them. In any situation, is a bad idea, a bad way to look at it. Um, so I just think it's super important. Yeah, I do prefer the team analogy. I think that's a little more appropriate, where you've got team captains and you've got coaches, and then you've got you know role players. And just because somebody wouldn't make a great team captain doesn't mean they're not an awesome role player. Um, you know, sometimes I think when you're doing the family thing, it's a little egotistical to say I'm their parent and they're my children. It's a little I think that's an little it's, a, it's an analogy. A little no, a no little patronizing, um, in my opinion, for that kind of thing. But um, it is good to have. You know, if you're really willing to fight for everybody, that's the important part. So even though maybe he expresses it a different way, I do think it's really important to look at everybody and really care about them because that's the opposite of the type of leader who thinks that everybody is totally expendable and makes yeah, a ton of cuts right. just because it's convenient and for And because they're line. the smartest person in the room, right? Right. Yeah. Um, quote of the week. I will go first. Oh, well, this is Q&A and device. Oh, man. You got nothing? You start. Um, just we, I've looked over like over 200 resumes in the last couple of weeks uh, for some new people we're hiring. And my advice to people out there looking for gigs is email format. I mean, this is for me. Maybe other people look at it differently. But email formatting is so extremely important and following directions is so extremely important. So for our interview process, we have people answer like three questions. Like, give me an example of a project that you worked on that you're really proud of. Um, give me an example of this, this, and that. And then what is your ultimate dream job? And you have 48 hours to respond. And we had 190 applicants and only 37 answered the three questions that we asked them. So it automatically weeded out all those people that either weren't interested in the job anymore or just didn't want to go forward with those line of questioning. Um, but I, 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 I realized I judged the people a lot on how they formatted, how they yeah. spelled on their email, how they organized. Because if you're going to be client facing for us, you can't just have this huge paragraph of text that makes no sense. The people that said... Hey, Mr. Brickley, thanks for the questions. Bullet point number one, bullet point number two, bullet right. point, you know, really looking forward to the next step. Um, I realized and that's that. I, and that's not just us being picky. Yeah. I mean, that's something where if you can't explain yourself well in an email, then you're right. It's it's impossible to have a client facing a role because sometimes the hardest part of a job that we're doing is like, do we need to hop on a call or can we just bullet point this out in an email or an SOW and putting your thoughts down clearly on a piece of paper or in an email in a structured way is super it's important. A skill. So yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so, I think to maybe further on that a little bit for my advice part is practice talking on the phone. There have been a few hires where within the first five to seven seconds, that's another thing. we know that they're going to be good and we know that we'd be totally Here's fine the with them if being you, on the phone. If you follow the directions that the, the interviewer is giving you in terms of, Hey, I need this, this, and this from your cover letter. I need your resume. And I need you to answer this question. Um, if you answer those three things, you have good email formatting. You're already in the top 5%. Yes. At least for everybody that we've ever hired, you're already in the five. Then if you hop on a call and you, like you said, articulate yourself well and don't ramble and, and it sound pretty good, 
you're in the top 1%. Yeah. So if you just do those three small things and practice at them, all of a sudden, I think you're putting yourself in the top 1% of all candidates in almost every job. Right. Yeah. And first impressions are huge, especially when you're doing something like a phone interview or just, you know, a, a quick first call. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I get a certain sense of somebody within the first few seconds. And if you answer, you know, especially if you know that you're expecting a call, if you answer hello, like you're surprised that someone's calling you or as if you're caught off guard versus hi, this is so-and-so, you know, like it just the, the first tone of the call felt very professional for just about everybody that we've hired when we do the first call. So yep. that's important. Figure out how to uh, be professional on a phone call. On my Simon Sinek uh, kick here, my quote of the week is, quote, as an executive or as an owner of a company, you're responsible for the people who are responsible for the people who are responsible for the customer. And I think as you grow, as you have managers, as you scale – you're, you're at the top. You're not going to be dealing with the customer on a every project basis. You're not going to be emailing them every day. So to think that I'm an amazing owner because I, I love all my customers and I talk with them every day. No, you don't. Your people talk to them every day. So if you don't right. train your people correctly and you don't treat your people with respect, they're not going to do a good job. And ultimately, your customer is not going to get a good product. Right. So I think as, as any company out there, you continue to scale and build out these different departments, that is a very important thing that I, that yeah. I took. And for me, I've been really surprised because the way that I interact with clients and customers is very different than how some of our employees interact with them, but in a great way. So, you know, if I were to tell everybody this is the Brett Regan training manual on how to interact with a client, it would feel very kind of forced for certain people. And there's other people in the office that are super, right. totally overly friendly, but that's genuine. That's how they are. And in certain scenarios, it's better than the way that I would do it, or at least just different in an okay way. So I think you can set certain parameters for like, you know, we always talk about we really want to feel professional great customer service, always give them an answer. If you don't have one, go back and get one kind of thing. Um, yeah, especially you set the in framework LA. of like how, how best to yeah. manage a client, but you don't tell them exactly. Yeah, and then let, the let them kind of do their own thing because- Put their spin in, on in it, their way. language on it, yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, so my quote of the week is, try not to become a man of success, rather become a man of value. And that's from Albert Einstein. And I actually- and thinking about that in terms of less about me as it is as a company. So don't try to become a successful company, become a company that's really valuable to every one of your clients. Um, and I, like I think it. sometimes if you're reading, you know, especially like Inc and Entrepreneur and Venture and all these other magazines, it can feel like, well, how are you growing and scaling and doing all these things? And that becomes the Silicon metric Valley, by yeah. which you are determining your success. Mm -hmm. Um, and to kind of go back to my business goals of like making our, our current clients super happy, that's what's made our growth happen anyway. And that becomes your sales department, really, because they yeah. just refer you to other people and they move on and they love you so much. So, um, yeah, I'd rather have one sales guy and just all my clients refer us constantly than have a no referrals because we do a bad product and they have to have yeah. 19 salespeople on the phone every day. And if all of our clients are just like, Estian's great. They're really great. We're going to hit them up every time that we have a budget for a project. Um, that's what I want out of it. So I think that's kind of a, a cool way to think about the company being valuable to the client rather than being, quote unquote, successful in the market. So we will uh, go to Facebook Live. We have a comment here. David Furker. David Furker always coming through. favorite thing. It's a sleep setting on an iPad. They have a setting where you can turn on alarm on when it's time to go to bed. So I have it go off at 11 p.m. Been amazing at helping me go to sleep earlier. Got to get that seven plus hours of sleep. Yeah, there that's that was the tech tip, I think, from my previous episode it? when I talked about it. So I've said it, <laughs> and as soon as it goes off, I have a natural reaction to silence any notifications it's uh, because it's annoying. So it happens, I silence it, and then like 40 minutes later, I'm like, oh, wait, did my, oh, yeah, it did. So working on it, working progress. We're going to have a new segment called like going back at uh, previous goals and uh, I know, see if we can. But it's a good thing to probably look back at, you know, once a month or once every couple of months at yeah. all of our business goals and our work-life balance and how that's changed. All right, there it is. You can always email myself and Brett. I'm at David at STN.digital. He's at Brett, B-R-E-T-T -T, at STN.digital. Uh, this has been Entrepreneur Wrap episode five. Uh, hope you subscribe on iTunes. And if you like the show, give us a five-star rating. We'd appreciate that. We will see you next week.